All right, welcome everybody, day 28. So, crafts. Now, we've done a long stretch of noddling to get the guide working. We've done a long stretch of rigging to get rid of it, ironically. Um, the nature of this profession do things just to undo them before they reach animators. And we are overdue for a little bit of theory. Uh, and this has been a long time coming, but we needed examples and stuff like that to do it. So without further ado, we are going to talk about graphs, um, the way Maya sees them and uses them, or some approximation of it. So before we begin, uh, as usual, these are valid models for when you have to explain what is going on and you know teach some of the basics it doesn't mean my works exactly like this this is you know viable view of um how like it behaves uh but by no means it is how it actually works so let me see super quickly yeah, this should be, let's go even larger. 22, <clears throat> okay. Now, we have discussed graphs and I will, um, I will ask that if you haven't seen the very first episode, I will ask that you look at that, um, you look at that first the first episode was about set theory and graph theory we are basically going to be starting from there and what we have said is that if a set will give you a bunch of nodes then a graph will give you what's called edges which are literally connection between nodes and nothing else now there's different types of graphs um and maya um almost everything in it that is relevant to rigging is hinging around the dependency graph. The difference between a normal graph and a directed graph, and a dependency graph is a directed graph, is that the edges become arrows. So there's directionality. And what that is saying is if you have a set of nodes, then you also have a set of connections. So for, if you have a set of A, B, and C, which are your nodes, you also have a set of edges such as these so nodes not natural numbers edges where we have ac and bc hopefully you all remember this um again first episode of this season season one you will find more on the subject now, the other thing we discussed, and this was the pilot season, you can look through the videos or search the site, cultofreak.com, uh, is application loops. So in the simplest possible terms, uh, Maya as a client will have a couple of long running loops. Uh, more, more than that, but again, we are not after accuracy unless you are, um, you have access to the Maya code base uh, you can be accurate. I do not have access to the Maya code base. So we are going for a model that we can use to explain things. So let's say that we have a GUI loop and a view loop. Now, what I mean with that is that from a programming standpoint, this might be literally as simple as Maya having something like this. So while global running is going, then, okay, while, uh, this wouldn't be a while, but anyway, uh, there might be something like Paul GUI. Again, this is very unlikely to be what Maya does, but And let's say that they use ints. This is C-ish kind of syntax, but uh, hopefully you, I find that for sudo works better than Python. Hopefully you will understand. 
and then they might have something like this so what I mean with something like that is that Maya will basically constantly be looking at the GUI and uh, as far as I know, Maya is at this point entirely QT. I don't think there is any uh, leftovers from the old motif days. And basically, while global running, let's say that we have a global variable somewhere that is always true until you do file exit. So if you do that, that is set to false. Maya will basically go, oh, I'm not while global running. This might be the main. takes no arguments or anything actually it might take command arguments it doesn't matter and you might have something like this so until you go exit or until there is a crash coming from some loop or something like that oh the typo um, Maya will basically keep running. The other thing that happens is that there's likely to be a viewport loop. So you're doing something in here. Um, and this is like we discussed it when we talked, that talked about application loops. Uh, so I'm not going to go into the details, but it's one of the trickier parts to deal with when you write an application that has a viewport. And basically some action in here uh, might inform Maya that it needs to reevaluate. So in this example, uh, let's say that our viewport loop looks at all of the geometry that is in. And if this is out, you know, the viewport loop might register that the transform for this cube has left the viewport. And it's therefore uninteresting. Maybe we don't want to render the geometry any longer. Little bit trickier than that because this might... Um, this might not just have a fixed bounding box. You want to check that the bounding box is off screen. If it is being deformed, uh, you have to evaluate the rig of these to know the bounding box of the geometry because the deformation, your, your base geometry might be in here. Your bounding box might be the same as the cube as it is now, but the deformation might be pushing it there. So you need to figure out what the deformation is uh, on some course level to figure out if it's in the viewport and therefore it needs drawing and all of that. That is all the detail that we are going to go through. So at some point, some of these events, uh, you have added a constraint between objects, you, um, you have manipulated the viewport and so on, will do something to your graph, which is basically what you see here. And uh, like this is the primitive that generates the geometry in example. So if I were to change the subdivision level, something has to produce this effect and then it's sent to the viewport again. And that's why the viewport loop is often circular um, to some extent. Uh, it has at least a few cycles where it will tell you the geometry is in view, uh, therefore it needs drawing and it's updating, does, um, this modifies it and so on and on. Hopefully that's still clear and let's stop there. Now, what is going on with the graph level itself is what we're interested in. So we are going to forget about those loops and assume that the Maya magic that is provided to us will take care of things. But if you ever wonder why something maybe leaves the viewport and doesn't come back in, uh, there's been bugs over the years. It's not an easy system to do. Maya is a very complicated one that has callbacks and script jobs and everything that can in interfere and inject themselves into those. Let's do something extremely simple here. And let's get a locator. Let's get a cube. Uh, I think I can just delete this and it'll keep my history. Do not need shapes only care about these so at some point I decide to connect these so that I can do this work now how does Maya actually know that me moving this locator should actually draw the cube there 
because that's basically what we're after. That's the effect that we're at. If the cube is hidden, will it be evaluated? We are going to get into that, yes and no. If you're in digi mode, no, it will not be. Uh, but that was an artifact of some digi tricks. Uh, if you're in parallel mode, as of 2017 or 2018, I don't remember, there is a hidden evaluator uh, which can help you by making it not evaluate when it's hidden. And there was a big uproar because people thought that it was a bug when parallel evaluation came out that the hidden objects, um, objects that had the geometry hidden were still evaluating their full stretch of the graph. And people assume that it's natural um, for something hidden to not evaluate. It is not. It was a side effect of how the old DG graph was working. Now, we're not quite going to go into DG in parallel and so on all that much. Uh, that is for when we look at the profiler at the optimization. Now we're interested in figuring out how this magic actually works. So, something here has to evaluate this graph to know that if this is activated and it's doing something, this object will also need to be changed in some way. And this is where we have a look a slightly, only slightly more complex um, expression, I guess, than these. So let's get ourselves another null. And I might as well get myself more real estate as well. And let's say that we want an average. Um, yeah, we have a is there an average node in Maya plus minus average? Yes. We could also, actually, we're going to do it by hand. And what is it? Plus minus average? Yeah. So let's take a very simple graph and look at what is going on. We also. We want to do an average, but because the average node will do it all at once, uh, we don't want that. We want a couple of nodes to talk about these. We are going to take these and do the average by hand. So I have two inputs. I'm adding them, then I'm dividing by two, and then I'm getting that output in the translate of the cube. So my expectation here is that as I move either of these locators, uh, the cube will end up in the middle. There you go, we have it working. So how is this being done? First thing we need to explain is that there are a couple of different types of nodes. And Maya, sorry, a couple of different types of base graphs that people will often discuss. And, um, and I have heard people arguing, oh, Maya is this, Maya is that. Maya actually is a very hybrid graph as far as I'm concerned. Let's go to Mischief and let's get the magical overlay going. So what do we have here? Let's say that we have node A and node B. And we're only going to consider the translate here. Um, so we're only going to be interested in a plug. And then you have these. We're going to say it's C. This is going to be D, and this is the end node. This is the end gain. So we're going to call it Z in case we add anything in between. I think that at this point, this should still be making sense. So what is going on here? Now, you will sometimes see here there's two types of graphs, and it's like evaluation graphs and data graphs. And it's like, yeah, can kind of accept it. So if each of these nodes uh, is accepted to host some data, um, you could say that this has a translate in it and that's going to be a vector free. So we have X, Y, and Z. Same for these. This is data. And this is actually, let's say it was a little bit simpler than these, also has a vector free. And this one here, this multiply divide, also has and for us, this has got two vector free, sorry. Uh, 
This also has two vector free, the second one we've input by hand. Uh, and these are not translate actually, do I? Sure. This is any two vector free, I'm sorry. And then ultimately in here, we do another translate vector free. And that goes out to the viewport. It doesn't, it actually goes out to the geometry that needs to be informed on how it's transformed. But, you know, this is a sufficient approximation for what we, um, for what we want to describe. So if we say that the nodes are data, uh, then the edges will need some quality. And I'm still editing the functional uh, video will come out on the weekend. So episode 13 was a long stretch of functional. It might help if it's not out yet. Hopefully you can still follow. If you are watching these late enough in the life of Kota Free, you will have watched episode 13 and that will help. So the edges are the operations that we want to work with. So these two edges, this could just be keep the data and this could be add in place, basically. That will mean that we become interested in the output of these and from these two vec free, and you can see how this is confusing if you don't go hybrid, these two vec free basically become just the one vector free so only the output type matters hopefully you are still with me so we're gonna get rid of this and we are now gonna say that only our up output type matters as far as the data goes so the data signature of the node is like that now we need to do the same for this one now in here we have a constant coming from somewhere that is a vector free, which is the 222 that I used to divide. And in here, going here, this is a divide. We have keep this data uh, divided by this. So the divided equal kind of thing. And this node holds onto our output. So there's the const vec free. Actually, this might be a little bit confusing because of the colors. Let's say that this is actually some virtual node somewhere and this becomes more important when we look at static statically topologized graphs uh, like the m when you kick in parallel but and this is dividing place now the type of this node is only its output it goes out we're good this one here basically becomes just keep whatever is in there and I'm using A, I'm sorry, I hope this makes sense. It just means keep the data, it doesn't matter all that much. You could practically ignore it, look at the arrows. And it goes in in one, it goes out to the viewport with something that is probably a lot more complex than that. So <clears throat> the fact that this exists and that it goes out basically means that its type is not trans vector free its type is actually something like DAG transform, let's say. And this is a very rich, very complex type. And the viewport <clears throat> has something in here that can make use of these complex types to do the drawing and all of that. Um, Actually, in, somebody was saying in parallel mode, it's more complicated. Parallel mode makes everything very, very easy. The problem with the understanding of parallel mode is the steps between parallel mode and so on. Now, if this seems confusing, it's that um, it can be a little bit confusing. So let's get rid of that for a moment. And let's say that instead of doing that, you have some operation graph, which is probably a simpler view. Now, 
if in here you have a translate, let's say that the user is manipulating and that's your data, your data here is, let me figure out the colors as we've been doing it. Okay. So the nodes remain green, operations are yellow, and data is blue. Now, somewhere here from the manipulation, I am generating data. I'm creating a translation value in some space. That is our data. Same thing, and it gets saved. As I'm done manipulating, they just get saved somewhere. This is a bubble of data that exists. I'm doing the same for, in my interaction, as have you seen it, I'm doing the same thing for locator 2. Now, in here, basically, the edge sort of becomes relevant, and all that matters is that this type, the translation type, is actually valid for the entire stretch of the evaluation. So I'm interested in this region of the graph. Little audio clip. Is the gain too high? It might be. Thank you. Dropping the volume by one notch. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. So the only thing that we care about is that we go from a type translation or from whatever type, sorry, that we're, we have input through our view manipulation to a type translation that the cube can digest, transform into what we have called the DAG transform. And that is something that the viewport can actually understand. Now, chat, I need your help let me know if any of these doesn't make sense. This is actually a pretty important step in understanding how your rig works. Um, so what these nodes become, they become functions, literally. So the locator here, basically, let's say, is a host function. Its, uh, its job is to be able to take something that comes from the viewport, from the manipulation, and save that data somewhere so that it can be passed on in this case, untransformed. Or even better, you could look at the manipulator generating a DAG transform. And this locator being able to be a filter that can divide it into the word transform, the local transform, and so on. Regardless, it remains a host and filter kind of operation. It takes something complex, it breaks it down to whatever the request is of the next function. Now, this plus minus average, we have to respect types. Types aren't really much of a concern. Is um, This is why I don't like these mixed nodes. But let's say that this is literally just a plus. It wants two translations. So this breaks it apart and gets us a translation data. This wants two translations pumps them into a plus operation, and that gets us another translation. This goes on. So the connection, you can see, ooh, you can see that the colors change as in the Y. Do my bidding, there you go. Um, because you, you're kind of doing the same thing, don't get me wrong, but the nature of where you're doing things conceptually is all that changes. Now, this multiply divide, I can eventually do the color thing, right? I know I can. So, this takes two translations. One other is going to come from somewhere else. Some constant host. Hopefully these that generates come on that generates a translation and that goes in here. Uh, this one will divide one by the other. So these are all functions. Uh, this takes complex data, breaks it apart and gives nodes asking for stuff what they want and so on. This is an addition. Uh, so this will literally be, you know, plus A and B kind of thing. This is a plus. 
<coughs> very least like syntax. Now, it also restitutes a translation that moves on and the cube knows how to do the whole aggregation thing. So this cube might be fetching data from many other places. I might have the rotation coming in from somewhere else and knows how to serve it to the view. Hopefully this is still making sense. Now, how is Maya a hybrid? Now, this thing here with data graphs, um, pure data graphs like these, they are generally not used anywhere that I can think of in our industry. Um, there are a lot of applications like financial where you're very data heavy, often does data partitioning in the form of a graph so that you can then apply sets of operations to that. Uh, machine learning, maybe not so much. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Now these, however, this is extremely common, maybe, and it's the parallel graph side of things kind of almost has a closer tie to these. But when you're programming, you might be used to saving, um, to saving a lot of data and variables. Basically, you keep storing stages of the data and so on. But um, in imperative programming, if you write some Python, if you write, you know, your bog standards, C++ and so on. However, what we're looking at here is the transformation of data in a graph like this. The only data that you have that you start from is somewhere and it might come from the manipulations. It's this immutable thing here. And then it gets passed on bit to bit and so on until you have some singular piece of data on the other end that you're interested in and it gets transformed. Nothing is kept in between. So as these nodes fetch this stuff and pass it on, that data isn't saved in some local magic variable. It's just passed on. It's processed. It becomes new data and then it has no life left. Now, the problem with a system like that, um, and hopefully that makes sense. You're literally saying, hey, I have these two variables, you know, A and B or whatever it, it is. And these are the arguments of a function, basically. And I have this output that I'm expecting in the view, that's Z. You could literally take these two variables and push them through operations in a chain. Uh, so with your, your filter here going to the plus minus average, so we're using these for a plus. So let's say that you have plus of these two things. So you have plus of host one and host two. Uh, multiply divide will take that and divide it by a constant. So that is the, we're using the divide there. So we're dividing that by some constant coming from somewhere. Uh, the translate is interested in that result. Now that H1 and H2 in turn will be filtering something. So you will get something like the filtering of A, filter one of A and filter, it will still be a filter prime. It will still be a filter in fact of B and it goes on and you go, okay, this Z here is equal to that hopefully still making sense Whew. so what does maya do both maya does not discard the data it does not do this pure functional thing where you have some origin data it figures out all of the evaluation and just keeps transforming it until it's needed somewhere uh, <clears throat> it doesn't do what have i done some shortcut that's interesting. Okay, sure. Uh, it doesn't do this thing where you have just the data and then your edges are actual operations because the nodes represent both the data and the operation. Still making sense? I hope so. Now, so what Maya does, and this is pretty important, 
is Maya in these nodes. Let me get myself a little bit more space. And I need real estate. And let's add a little bit of complexity to this, just the tiniest bit. Let's say that we want to reuse stuff. I'm going a lot slower than I thought I would have been going, to be honest, but <clears throat> this is pretty important. It cannot be rushed. Uh, why am I obsessing over this stuff is beyond me. So let's say that for this sphere, <clears throat> we are interested in adding the two positions or we're interested in just the one or we want to take two other nodes or whatever. But anyway, part of this graph is going to be shared. Maybe we want a different multiply divide. It doesn't matter. So yeah, I'm just adding the two. It doesn't really matter. What we care about is that there are operations happening and results. Sorry, still after real estate because this next bit is going to get a little bit busier. There you go. <clears throat> So we're now here and if you look at this kind of stuff, you could see that there will be some dangerous duplication. I was about to drag the nodes with my pen. Um, there will be some duplication where you go, okay, if I am just getting stuff this way and I'm generating something here and this is pushing and pulling and going ahead with the data through this chain of operations, when that data goes to this object, I have to recompute everything. What do I mean with that? We say that these are, let's now call them with simple letter C, D, E, F, and our magic viewport remains Z. I think I had this as Z before. So <coughs> these also needs to be grabbed by the magic viewport. We only care to get to this point and to this point. If we were to do, if we we're purists where you go, okay, when this changes, because I'm manipulating the viewport, um, I am gonna go, okay, when this changes, it goes to C. C is gonna hold something to B <clears throat> and add them together. So I am gonna add A and B into C get the result to C, get it into D, get it to F and get it to the viewport. Now my viewport loop is this far, I have figured out F. Now my viewport loop moves on and goes like, I also need E. So E basically goes like, okay, I need A, I need B, I need to add them into C and then I can pass them on. Now you can see that this chunk is actually shared by both what F needs and what E needs. E needs it exclusively, whereas uh, F needs to add the D to it. So, and this is push and pull. So I'm departing for a moment from this, from the contents of it, because we want to figure out graph mechanics. Now, there is fundamentally two ways to evaluate graphs and hybrids are accepted and I strongly suspect that Maya is a hybrid and that is push and pull. Now, if a graph is directed, you can push through it. So in example, in a push graph, if I move a locator, I will basically be saying, okay, uh, I have moved that locator. It is now changed. What depends on it? We do have these arrows. So as I visit, my manipulation loop, which is on this end, before I reach the rendering loop, mm. 
DG is pool graph. Mm, not quite pure pool. Not that I know of. Because uh, it's a pure pool graph is um, has no interference, but it doesn't matter all that much. Uh, you want to know about both. So. Yeah. <clears throat> anyway. So what is happening is that when you're flagging these for operated on, it goes like, okay, there's new work that needs to be done. Um, I need to go out to C and uh, C will need B. So already you're kind of in a tricky position. If you're manipulating both, you will need to do a lot of work. But let's say that it goes like, I have data in here, I'm holding on to this data. The node knows the operation and knows the data that goes in. So A has changed its value. This port needs changing. This is being held on to. And then it goes, okay, I am also changing this data. What depends on that? Well, D depends on these. So I'm also going to evaluate D and I'm going to move on and I'm going to finally get to F. Now in here, there's two things connected to it. So you are going to go out to E as well and evaluate it and then go out to that. Now, once your manipulation goes to B, um, what is actually going to happen and this is there is polling to make sure that as many manipulations get done in one draw as possible and all of that it doesn't matter all that much so this is going to evaluate a and c with whatever data was in b and it's going to evaluate d and it's going to evaluate e and it's going to evaluate f and so on now the problem you have with something like that is that if you had something here that took both f and e before going to the viewport you will be flagging these and evaluating these. Now, once you push through the other path, despite the fact that these had already been reached and a lot of work had already been done, uh, you are still gonna go and push to it. So you're gonna get to this node and do the work many times. Now, some of that work is gonna be done on constants, uh, like this addition in example, um, the first time is gonna you're gonna add these two A and B. The second time you're still gonna add A and B just with different data, but you're still doing that work twice. And for an addition, it might be irrelevant. When you start having very complex nodes, evaluating a node many times because you have many hot paths in a push-only graph gets pretty expensive. Now the alternative to that is pulling the graph. And graphs are never this simple once it comes to their implementation for the record. Pulling the graph basically means that if you have your cube somewhere, my rendering loop starts, my viewport Z gets to this cube and goes like, okay, uh, my geometry here is very interested in please having the transform. And this might go on to other meshes. You know, the sphere is the next in the loop. Uh, which will very much like to have the result from here. Please, thank you very much. So what happens is that in a pool only graph, you basically first go, okay, this needs to be computed. And maybe the loop runs every n sec, every, sorry, n um, milliseconds or microseconds or whatever. Uh, doesn't matter quite yet, it will eventually. And this goes like, okay, I to happen, I actually need to know uh, about D. And for D to happen, D needs to know about C. And for C to happen, it needs to know about A and B. So if you do something like this in a pool graph, right away, without having to rely on stale data <coughs> that was hosted in here, beside the fact it solves other problems implementation-wise, you go, okay, I know that I need to do A, then B, then put them into C, and I need to get the magic const from here. Oh, I've used C. Um, okay, 
So there's some magic const in there. So I need to do the divide between those two. And that needs to go to F, which is going to filter the stuff. And that can go to the view. Now, once, so, you know, it's good. You got a pool, you know exactly what needs to happen, you evaluate it. And if you were in a pure situation where you don't store data anywhere, uh, Bob's your uncle. Now, if your loop, by some chance, can collect both of these and work on both of those at the same time, you have some chance for, you have some chance to collapse these. So these will not be applicable, not directly to the way Maya works in DG mode. And DG mode is kind of confusing because parallel is based on a dependency graph as well, but let's not go there. The old way Maya was evaluated, the single threaded, dirty stuff, literally dirty, and we'll explain that, is what people refer to when they say this is the DG evil. Now the sphere will basically be doing the same thing. It's been touched by the rendering, uh, by the viewport, it needs to go, okay, what do I need? Well, I need C, and I need A, and I need B. Uh, now, if we know, and we've talked about episode 13, hopefully it'll be out by the time you say it, if it isn't, don't panic just yet. Um, we know that A, B, and C, I could collect this stuff and go, A, C of A and B gets used twice. So both, and I will need to make some space for myself. I don't have, uh, let's do it under there. <clears throat> C for A and B is actually used twice. So it's as if I was going to go, okay, I could save these as its own thing, as its own, uh, let's say, big D for data. Big D, okay, uh, sure. Always realize it a second too late, doesn't matter. Uh, so that you could go the F of D of C A B would actually just use the ones. I'm hoping that these two make sense. And Eve will be doing the same thing. Now this gets, you can imagine with a graph like the one that we have even for a simple rig like the one that we've been working on, these can get very, very, very complicated if you look at it this kind of way. Uh, is it still making sense, chat? I hope so. So how do you do something like this? And this is where Maya gets a little bit weird, but it's worth for them for many years until parallel. Now nodes in Maya are basically made of two things. Each node, well, more than that, and there's many types of nodes, but let's simplify, we're talking about an MPX node, the simple dependency graph node like this. These have a data block which is literally all the data that it needs to do work and you can control it when you write plugins um, hmm. I'm wondering if I can select and move stuff I will hope so no I don't know doesn't matter Let's get rid of these. We're not going to overlay it again, I guess. And there is a compute. So the data block, depending on what we told it, is going to store these parts. So the data block knows that in this case, it's got the first input, the second input, and the third input, and that is literally data. So if these are of type vector free, you know that they are gonna be holding free floats or free doubles or whatever, and that keeps repeating. Now, the other thing that this node has is a compute. The compute is the one that is basically gonna go, okay, I am gonna run for each plug. So every time something happens to any of these plug, <clears throat> any of these plugs, all of them, including this one, which we're not saving in the data block, I am going to do stuff. Now, the classic thing everybody does to limit evaluations is as that compute runs all the ports, 
only if it's an output plug you care. So once it gets here, so something is requesting data from somewhere. Uh, so we go, okay, compute, and you'll find if plug is output, but we're gonna say the compute for output, and we don't care about all the rest, is gonna be, hey, I would like from my data block, I have these two that I'm using, I3 doesn't matter, I3 doesn't matter because it's an initialized. I will please, thank you very much, like to return you uh, I prime plus I second. Still making sense? I hope so. Now that is basically what is eventually gonna go there and there. Now, <clears throat> so m nodes in Maya contain data and know what to do with the data. Maya's job is to basically run all the plugs and call the right functions over whatever data that is stored very close to that function. Notionally, probably not in memory because I would imagine the computes are gonna end up all over the place compared to the data blocks, doesn't matter. Whew, hopefully still making sense at this point. <clears throat> so there's a mechanism called DigiDirty because this doesn't really get you away from the taxes of these and these. Uh, this just lets you implement things and gives Maya the responsibility for a lot of work. What about dirty state of attribute plugs? Yes, we're about to get to it. So, on top of this, there's... And what are the edges in Maya? So, if the node knows everything, what are the edges? Well, the edges basically signal what node asks what of what other nodes. On top of that, and this is entirely to the Maya internals, uh, let's say that this outer side of the plug, you're out of the node. So if you write your own node, you have control over all of these. Just out of here, you don't have that control. And we'll get into it. You can set plugs dirty, you can set the entire graph as dirty, you can trigger evaluations. But when you do that, when you say something is dirty, please evaluate and we'll explain what dirtying and evaluating is now, you are not really in control of much other than telling the Maya client, the big space out there that deals with your very localized implementations, hey, I have done the deed here, please do your thing. So what Maya uses as a way of optimization, and this is, is it becomes mostly untrue in parallel. Parallel is made of two things and we'll get to it. That's why I'm saying this is gonna take more than one string. Right now we just want to understand how graph evaluation works in Maya. There is the state of, sorry, there is the notion of a dirty state and that's something that comes from caches. Now, instead of having caches for everything and Maya might very well be keeping caches somewhere, there is a notion and we said it before, we have a manipulation loop here Approximation again, but remember Maya doesn't quite work that way, not exactly. And a rendering loop here. You do have a hybrid push pull where you go, okay, there is a pull to know that the viewport loop has encountered this, has reason to pull on it. So it's sucking that in. The dependency graph kind of goes this way if you want. If you imagine that this is the push of data the pool will basically be resolving that way. And you're going, okay, look, I am actually interested in these, uh, which means I am interested in these. Um, and in that, and in that, and in that. Now, and we say that there might be, ah, oh, there is, let's do it the rendering loop later on might get interested in the sphere and here it's interested in the cube. <clears throat> Time wasted, whatever. So it will go, okay, I am with all the means that we just talked about, I am actually going to evaluate A and B and C <clears throat> and D and E for you. Now, 
each of these plugs in the my internals also has a dirty state so when something changes this part of the graph as it evaluates and this is why it cannot work in parallel because it's an incredibly serial um, uh, sequential serial process goes like okay I need E D C A B I'm gonna do A B C D E so and that is basically the push part where all of this stuff gets evaluated now the pool says this is dirty it needs to be evaluated which means that the outer edge of this is dirty which means that this is dirty it needs to be evaluated so I need to call the compute in here so that means there's two in here and inside the nodes you have a layout that says these two plugs affect that one which is what gives you a further level of granularity um, so these have also been flagged which means I have to deal with these and I have to deal with these now all of these plugs have been set what is called dirty so you have a dirty pool you have a pool of dirty plugs that is basically saying okay I need to do ABCD I am gonna refresh the data internally now remember when we say we're not gonna store the output because it's actually largely immaterial <clears throat> uh, Maya might have the cache out here but unless you've made the output writable which is something that can have its dodgy consequences so you want you don't want to that caching is also available to you in your own node as you save the data now if the viewport loop gets to the sphere we have manipulated a and b through expressions through whatever it means and we've got to the point where e has been solved so once the sphere once the viewport loop reaches the sphere and asks the sphere okay uh look you know what i kind of need your translate you are dirty please evaluate it will go here and it will go okay I need this one so if these if this uh, cube evaluation is produced for the rendering um, and it means that all these nodes have run and nothing else has changed in the meantime which you really shouldn't uh, then all of these plugs will have been clean that's that's what the dirty clean thing you might have heard at some point basically means the pool evaluation basically figures out the chain of events they're ordered and evaluated in the other way and as they're evaluated there's a clean push where you go like okay you've evaluated you're done you're done you're done you're done you're done and served so those are now off the dirty pool they're, they're my internal implementation who knows how it works it's not for us mortals to know it doesn't really matter so once that plug gets here and it goes like I need this plug the previous pass has cleaned the plug so we'll go oh you know what if Maya has some cache of these in its own clienty thingy it will just get that cache you will not need to add these two numbers you will not need to know what was being filtered by two all of these has been elided it's it's been ignored it doesn't need to be redone now it's also possible that if you don't have that cache then what happens is that and the clean dirty state let's say is only in here uh, that it might have to do the addition but it will do it from whatever data is inside the node and it will not go out again so you can imagine if this was a bigger graph uh, that can be considerable because you could have not just these you know once for five nodes in a sequence and three share to the sixth you might have something pretty darn big with a lot of overlaps and that is why it is wise to work this stuff at the plug state well it was it's parallel processing has made all of these pretty tricky but hopefully you get the idea now if your graph was something like this you can imagine that the actual paths for this stuff to work out uh, and let's add another one whoa I keep oh. okay so your the actual pathing of what you would have to evaluate will first go here and then I need these and then I need these and then I need these and these and these and these you you can see how this is a lot of stuff now once it gets to this part 
it goes to here. Maybe it evaluates this again, but it evaluates it on, and actually, uh, that would actually also have done this. So, does this make sense? Yeah, kind of. It's a unary op in this case, might be a negate. So, once this gets here, maybe these nodes get recomputed again if there's no cache at this point, but that's it. It doesn't need to do one, two, three, four, five, whatever other nodes. Uh, if it also had some cache here, it would actually do practically nothing. It will get to this plug and go, hey, the output I'm getting is has already been clean. I need to do nothing. So does this make sense? I hope so. I very much hope so. Because I think it's what I wanted to do. I think it's, I don't think I've been too vague or, or meander too much, but um, but yeah, that is what is going to go on. Now, there is a lot of details to something like this and the implementation, like the devil is in the details. How you implement a graph makes a massive difference. What kind of graph you want to implement um, often completely changes the data structure. So what we have been talking about here is the DG mode. Now, very quick for it, because until we get into the performance bar uh, slash profiling side of things, we're not going to dwell on it. Um, the DG node is responsible for a couple of things, which is ordering the nodes the way they need to be evaluated, having knowledge of their dependencies. So knowing the edges are what the DG does in the hybrid Maya world where each node is responsible and highly responsible as well to host its own data as well as to compute that data and to serve it out. Like you can do a lot with nodes. Um, when you look at it, the DG part is all in the edges. And that's why, you know, if we go back to what we we're saying, this is not going to overlap anymore. Like all of these things are, they're not immaterial. It's important to know them divided and they apply more to some other things uh, but Maya is very hybrid it's very hybrid in it's not a clear hey just pull or just push uh, the loops are all mangled like the rendering loop will run over stuff and the manipulation is part of the rendering loop because you move like what's amazing in an application like writing an application the scale of Maya is when you're doing something like this have I, what the hell? <laughs> oh yes, of course. No, I'm stupid. It's not my in this case. I just happen to be stupid. When you're doing something like this, it's actually pretty magical how much stuff just happens. Because what you're doing is Maya is catch is constantly catching up. Is a constant control fall of like, oh, you've changed something, and your expectation is that everything draws in sync. But to draw this stuff, it needs to constantly catch up at what you're doing. So when you see lagging manipulations and stuff like that, that is a very go complex graph taking time to catch up to what you're doing. There is a constant loop going on here where everything you do here triggers a manipulation. Dirt is huge swaths of the graph, gets to inform the rendering, which then needs to transform the geometry. It's like it's a gazillion operations that go on at all times. It is not trivial work to do. So if you ever want to write your own 3D application and you want to have it very heavily centered on a graph the way Maya did, it's, it's serious engineering. Now, that is a helpful mental model, let's call it, of some of the bits that come into these. Uh, if you were to start writing plugins, these will come in handy. Um, sorry, writing plugins, I mean writing actual evaluation nodes. But it is a simplification. It is almost parallel. The way it really, really works under the hood, um, who knows? I mean, unless you are one of the engineers. So last thing, the four I was talking about before I lost myself into contemplation of the viewport loop is <clears throat> the DG mode is not obsolete. When you run in parallel, you remember how I said this is extremely serial for these to do the work with this dirty mechanism. You can't really run in parallel. If I have another CPU here, you know, if this chunk is been doing by, let's use a new color, 
if this chunk is being done by one CPU, one thread, one logical unit, whatever you want to think of it as, when you work in parallel, there is another CPU here doing the work in there. This stuff might be changing the data in here by virtue of doing that at any moment. And this is this, this all kind of stuff in parallel programming. It's like race conditions and all of that. But we're not going to worry about that just yet. But imagine you were doing that work, multi-threaded, in a very abstract sense. Uh, your cube will be going, hey, I'm on CPU 1. Mental model, not how it really works. <laughs> I'm on CPU 1. I'm going to do this. So in the timeline of your CPU, let's say that this is 0 of the time goes back and at time, you know, 1.2 sometime units, it's figured out that it needs these at time, you know, 1.3, it's figured out that it needs these at time 1.4, whatever, sorry, it's, I should be there. At 1.4, it's figured out these, and now it's only one CPU, so there's a little bit of a gap. This is how we're going before it's figure out that and then it's got to go back and computing things can take a long time if the nodes are expensive and you go okay I am here I have done my work I'm now here and this is two seconds cool uh, sorry to whatever time unit we're using then you get here and this is an even more expensive node dividing super tricky this is by the time you're out there so by the time you're here, let's say it's super fast, you're at 205, but divide is super expensive, you, and it's a constant, you should have multiplied by the reciprocal, whatever. Um, you're at four here, and by the time these can be served back to the viewport, you're at five. Now this one gets here, and you know this is faster, it's closer, so you're at one point, you know, does it doesn't have these in the middle to travel so if you're at zero we say we're oh, I can do this if you're at zero here you traveling back need another color <laughs> pink I never use this pinky thing so you're at zero here you get here and we say you know maybe the first node takes is 1.2 you have just raised the other CPU to this node so you are computing these and if this is a more complex graph there's all kind of overlaps you made it to this one in 1.3 and maybe this cpu was freer and this one had just had a context switch so it's lower so maybe makes it to here at 1.32 can you see how this is going asynchronous like the two cpus are in different timelines so when this does the deed and cleans things up and there's sharing as well. Sharing stuff between CPUs is very expensive. So normally you want to duplicate things. Um, you can see that if we were relying on this mechanism for a parallel evaluation, it will get tricky because one CPU might be cleaning a plug. Um, but this might be scattered because if you have many CPUs and you have many nodes with all these different distances in a graph like this, they could start getting cleaned and dirtied at all kind of different times and what the CPU <coughs> will finally push back to the rendering will be a mix of all these states everything will go to crap so that is where it gets tricky and that's why I'm saying the DG mode is how the single threaded stuff the old single threaded stuff works but the interstitial part of figuring out the dependencies figuring out the edges figuring out what is going on and so on that is used to build a meta graph of sorts for the parallel evaluation. And that's the end of that foray, where the DG mode is still running. That's the first step of the parallel evaluation to do, hey, you know what? And this is absolutely not how Maya works under the hood in parallel. Uh, I'm about to give you, you know, again, it's a fault model kind of thing. But these might go, okay, I got A, B, C, D, E, and F. Don't store data, don't do anything. I know that my viewport loop is going to run E and then F. 
and stepwise. So it's going to run E, which is going to be D by C by A and B, we say. And it's going to run F by D by, not by D, sorry, F by C by A by B. So what you could be doing in parallel in this case is that you can save this stuff like that alighting re-evaluation that the dirty mechanism helps you with. Um, it's just not going to work because that only works if you walk the graph serially, if you respect the order of your input, your manipulation loop and your viewport loop. But what you could do is, <clears throat> this is inefficient, not how the parallel works, is go like, you know what? The Digimod has figured out these dependencies. So I am actually going to create a copy of A and a copy of B and a copy of C and build these. And when I say not at all, it's actually not true. Probably there's something conceptually similar for this one. So if before doing my deed, if these are in two threads and the threading is actually different, it works on I don't know if it does sub islands anyway so if I do it this way and the digimod is used to figure out these dependencies then the um, EM the evaluation manager which is the second step before the evaluation graph can kick in is responsible to be able to disambiguate the graph what it could be doing is before the run it could be duplicating A into A prime and B into B prime and C into C prime it could not hold to data any longer with all the dirty stuff and all of that because we're we have no real reason we can go when there is no overlap we can go to this truly functional word and then he knows the exact sequence of things to do so you know the dg gives you this meta graph it gives you all the edges it gives you the dependencies and the responsibilities some em stage in the middle will basically say, hey, you need an A1, a B1, and a C1, and I am going to duplicate them for you and give them to you so that it can go to A substitution stage before the CPUs kick in, like that. And now the EG gets this expansion and the EG is the evaluation graph and it can run in an almost purely functional mode where it only cares about what's coming in and then all of this stuff is individual to each and the solutions are still compatible with the viewport that's why to get parallel processing they have to introduce this parallel mode that is actually parallel as is on, on parallel tracks to the main one is it still making sense I hope so because I am spent so this is how, more or less, you can think of Maya graphs working. Chat, I got a dash. I am giving you about one minute to come up with questions. If you switch off viewport, will dirty propagations to work, but graph won't continue in Digimod, right? So if you switch off viewport, you mean if you run Maya in a headless mode, maybe? So like if you don't have the viewport loop at all contributing, uh, I assume if you mean that, so there's no viewport loop, there's no you manipulating stuff, uh, then the graph won't compute in DG mode. Dirty propagation was to bro gra work but graph won't compute in DG mode, right? Yes and no, that's actually a very good question. So this might help uh, clarify things. Now, and that's why I'm saying this is a valid mental model to understand things. Maya's workflow is much more complex than that. I have mentioned as purely as an example, as a context, thank you, that is a really good question, actually. You have the manipulation here and you have the viewport here. And the reason I chose this example is that, well, A, it exemplifies the trickiness 
and it might make you not less frustrated because they're super frustrating but it might make you understand uh, why sometimes you get really weird refresh issues that is one type of loop but you have to remember that it is not the only one so your viewport does this really tricky really fast you know slide of end to catch up to what you're doing and that is why parallel doesn't quite work in the viewport it's always in dg mode when you're manipulating parallel can only kick in in animation now that's becoming fuzzier but let's say that you're stuck with maya 2016 when you do stuff in the viewport your graph does not evaluate in parallel it cannot do all of this work uh, in time to catch up to what you're doing in the viewport what we're talking about here is not really the viewport itself the viewport is something that will flag these things as dirty will say that hey if i manipulate these you know they're dirty you you know you you need to do work and that's why i was saying there's there's always a hybrid of push and pull it doesn't mean if it all was just a pure pull from what is in viewport you will not get anywhere the other thing that happens is that if a dag item has and that's why there's dag items with a transfer and baked in which are very different than the dg items because they need to run on a different loop in a way if one of those not by any manipulation but if any of those is uh dirty like you can think of dirt in the node as well um then what is happening is that you're basically sending a signal saying hey everything that depends on these is actually at risk does it get anywhere um so and how does that work now there's other loops there's not just the viewport loop and so on but even without the um, particular quality if any node and this is where parallel really kicks in has anything connected to a function curve now that is a very good candidate for parallel so if you move the time the function curve is basically every frame dirt in these <clears throat> informing it that there's work that needs doing um, hopefully that makes sense so there's many things that can basically say hey your graph needs to reevaluate its operations and now um, this might give you some time because I'm gonna open a white chrome there is a document um, parallel evaluation it gets updated every version 2018 pdf so i think if you search for parallel evaluation maya 2018 pdf yeah you will get using so actually even better look for using parallel maya 2018 pdf and you should get these PDF that's <laughs> linking to the 2017 it's fine it was great for the 2016 version it was even better for the 2017 and it's mostly meant on the engineering side if you write plugins and so on uh, this is really important it might be tough for you to digest it still give it a shot even if you're not an engineer if you don't program if you understood most of what I've gone over um, it will tell you a lot more stuff so Maya really wants static data and function curves are static data um, for the parallel level. So there's a number of things that can trigger this. Manipulation is interesting because it plays the catch up with the actual rendering part of the viewport. It's uh, you know it's a serpent biting its tail kind of thing in Ouroboros. Uh, but function curves like Maya parallel loves function curves. You need several just to make sure that the entire graph is evaluated appropriately. skim through it once need to read it again a lot of it is details because uh, there's look, last thing then i really got a dodge out of here uh get out of dodge whatever um the last thing you probably need to know remember when i was saying there's these let's call it interstitial part between all of your nodes i like this color i need to use it more often all of these that's why i was saying this interstitial part here all of this blank space there's a lot of work going on there that's what maya does for you it's all those edges it's figuring out what's dirty and what isn't and so on so if you remember i said you can really go to the outside of your node and say hey do this bunch of things well you used to be able to in dg mode you can do some truly ungodly dark things See, my, my daughter just hearing about 
where I'm going, like she disapproves. So what you could do is you could, A, inside the node, you could actually walk the scene graph, find other nodes and do terrible things. Because of this duplication mechanism, again, I don't know if it does exactly this, but it's a valid, uh, it's, it's a useful model because it explains these things and it explains why these things cannot be done anymore. Um, the you will be able in the past in digimon you still are you could set things dirty so you could work in here and look at another node in the scene and set dirt dirty so you could do things like you could do some heavy work in here replace all the data with the cache internal to the node uh, then flag this port as clean look in the scene all kind of dynamic tricks were done this way look out in the scene for a bunch of other nodes flag them as needing evaluation then what maya will do is basically go like oh all right i need to do the deed for these and these and they will get here and they will find that this node is clean and you've already rewritten the internal cache and they will they will fetch something so you you could do some pretty interesting things with these um then the problem is when you do something like that is because you know these if these were different cpus these could raise these here sorry the second one could raise the first one to there you could get uh you could get to their mid computation and you can't do it you can't do set dependence dirty anymore from you can't mess with the dirtiness of the graph or with the exterior nodes from the one you're implementing when you're using parallel So somebody's asking, are you sure my in parallel mode evaluated something in the G mode to build EE graph? I thought you could build it using static attribute effects networks. Uh, read the PDF. Uh, the PDF literally tells you that. Now, attribute effects networks inside the node, they don't do anything really that I know of. They're not they tell the node how to behave, how to dirty things. Literally, that's what they do. As far as I'm, as far as I know, when you add those attribute effects, they're basically they go to the outer edges of the node and inform how the general operations should be in dirty things and so on. Uh, the DG mode is definitely aware of how they operate, or at least of their consequences, because the internal mechanics go, oh, you know, this is this has been dirty, resolve it to that. As far as I know, there's a full DG level of the graph that informs the EM about the duplicity. Build the EE graph. I haven't heard it called EE graph, so you might be talking about something else. It might be blowing smoke. As far as... So... I... Yeah, I'll put the link to the PDF in the YouTube description, but seriously, using Parallel Maya 2018 PDF in Google, you're good. So, as far as I know, custom evaluators is another thing. This whole kind of stuff, like this is going a bit too far. Like what I wanted to cover is the DG, the general operations. Where is it? <clears throat> Evaluation, graph, invalidation. So as far as I know, you have an EG, which is the evaluation graph for parallel that is built from an evaluation manager of a DG pass. That's my understanding of how it works. Those are the specs for the nodes. Yeah, I can have a look at it. It will tell you as far as I know. Yeah. Serial, not, not what I'm after. Doesn't matter. So you have, there you go. An evaluation manager responsible for creating a parallel friendly description of your scene called the evaluation graph. So that I got right. DEM schedule CG nodes across available resources. So that I also got right, which is what I was saying. You know, the your graph exists. The EM basically figures out what it needs to do, uh, builds these alternative graph that uh, or the notions needed for all these tasks. It's DBB under the hood at the Intel multi-threading task-based library. 
Um, prior to evaluation, evaluating your scene, the EM checks if a valid EG exists. So, and the EG is a simplified version of the dependency graph. So yeah. Maya uses the dirty propagation mechanism to build the EG. So yes, he uses the DG's dirty propagation to build the EG. Okay, let's confirm. I did not blow smoke. Go me. All right, I really gotta go. I hope that this was interesting. Uh, got a little bit further than I wanted to in the end. So yeah, three things, DG, it's the interstitial part, it figures out all the magic, it's got dark art in it, it can do horrifying things to parallel, that's why it doesn't work in parallel. EM is the evaluation manager, gets its cues from the DG, does a lot of scheduling work, will duplicate what it needs to duplicate, will build the threads and the, well, the tasks for the TBB library under the hood, that gets passed on to the EG, which is the real parallel evaluation, um, evaluation graph that does the magic. All right, man, I was stuck. Thanks everybody for watching and have a great day.